This week's time team comes from an enchanted lake. This is Flangorse, in the middle of the Brecon Beacons in Mid Wales. And for centuries, local people have told stories about ghostly church bells under the water and a mysterious township lost at the bottom of the lake. Way back in the Dark Ages, a real live human king, to show how powerful he was, built this man-made island in the middle of the lake and stuck a palace on top of it. Who was he? Who were the builders? What happened to them all? The time team have got just three days to find an answer. This week's time team are Mick Aston, Bristol University landscape archaeologist, Carenza Lewis, Royal Commission on Historic Monuments, Phil Harding, Wessex Archaeological Trust, field archaeologist, Robin Bush, archivist, and Victor Ambrose, historical illustrator. Right, well, we've only got a limited amount of time, and I reckon it's going to be raining on and off all weekend, so... Uh, Optimism. We ought to get started quick. What are we going to do? This is a big enclosure uh, around the riding stables, and that in itself looks interesting. She's there with this sort of circular enclosure around it, uh, between the Cranog, the artificial island, and the early monastic site. We'll do perhaps some geophysics uh, in there, I think, at some stage, anyway. Why? What's so special about it? Well, it, it, this sort of shaped enclosure is the sort of thing we get perhaps in a, for a prehistoric settlement or even a post-Roman settlement, and you'll notice that the contour line actually goes round it, showing it's just a bit above... This brown one? Yeah, see, 160 metres. It's just a bit above the general sort of marshy area mm. down below. So it could have been an old island or something? Uh, well, a promontory, yeah. and it's an ideal place for somebody to, to have a settlement. But we're also actually on the edge of Lake Tony going to have a look at the, at the Cranog down here. Um, the archaeologists at Cardiff University and the National Museum of Wales have done quite a lot of work there already. But we've got permission to work with them and have a look through the silts around the edge of the island to see if we can find anything there that will give us an idea of what people were doing on that island. Um, it's actually got some quite secure dates from it already. We know that it was built in the late 9th century and that it was destroyed in 916, or thereabouts. We're hoping that... No, we'll thereabouts, about <laughs> it. It's spot on <laughs> from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Uh, and, and I have to say that this is one of uh, the better sites, documentary-wise, because we've got charters, we've got folklore. Eh, you name it, we've got it. I'm looking forward to this weekend, well, no end. Mm. Well, I've already got started. Um, what do you think of that, then, Tony? This isn't you, is it? No, <laughs> but uh, it is a, a rather fine log boat that was dug out of the lake. Um, it's in Bracken Museum now. And um, this I've actually got started to make, build a replica of it. I mean, it's pretty certain that, that anybody living out here would have been using boats yeah. like that. So you're making, what, a copy of it? It'll be as near as damn it, a one-over-one one replica. And, uh, oh, it's a cracker. Great. But well, let's get on, shall we? Yeah, yeah why not? It's nice raining again. See you later, Robin. Flangorse Lake in South Wales lies in the middle of the Brecon Beacons, about five miles from Brecon. It's one of the largest natural lakes in Wales, and the artificial island, or Cranog, is the only one of its kind yet discovered outside Scotland or Ireland. It's obviously a fascinating site for the time team, and what's brought us here is a letter we received from a Mrs Mitchell who lives and works near the lake. Dear time team, about 400 yards from my riding centre in Langorse is an island which we now know is man-made. I'd love to know what happened to the people who built it. Is there any archaeological evidence of their existence to be found in the area? Yours sincerely, Mavanwi Mitchell, Ellesmere Riding Centre. This is the field we're interested in with this circular, nearly circular hedge round it. I thought you ought to meet Chris and John, who are going to do the geophysics survey in the field with this amazing instrument. It's just like a, a glorified metal detector in a way, but it will pick up magnetic changes in the topsoil, and so we can actually identify any settlement, any features, any burning that's gone on within the field. It means we don't actually have to dig at this stage, and so we'll just be walking up and down with this, and it will bleep every now and again. Yeah, you'll hear it bleeping, you know, people are walking up and down and bleeping. Well, we better get on with it, haven't we, because we've got yep. limited time. Now, I've got to go up in the helicopter, yeah. which will be here soon, and we'll keep you informed what's going on. Yes, okay? Okay, that's great. Thanks, 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 Than
So we've got this extraordinary man-made construction stuck in the middle of this lake. Mm. The labour alone must have been phenomenal. Who on earth was it who would decide to build such a thing? Well, if you want the Welsh name, I've been practising. Yeah. It's called Eliseth, son of Tudor, and he was king of Brycheiniog, which that... was like Brecon? Yeah, it's the kingdom that included Langorse and the whole area around about it. And he seems to have had uh, an Irish ancestry. And these kind of artificial islands were common in Ireland, uh, but they're very rare, if not unique, over here. And not only that, in this part of Wales, you tend to get Irish-type inscriptions in an alphabet called Ogham. So that there is this, this kind of connection with Ireland uh, which finds its mirror in the construction of, of, of this Cranog. We don't really know why it was built here, uh, whether it was for defence. It was obviously fortified to a degree uh, because it had to be captured uh, at a later date. Uh, but it may also have had a, a kind of mystical, almost a ceremonial purpose as well because you wouldn't have got the entire king and his household and all his camp followers onto there at any one time with any great degree of comfort. It's pretty little, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So if they didn't live on the Cranog, could they have lived here in Mrs Mitchell's D-shaped field? The geophysics team are in the process of trying to find out. And at the edge of the field, a small dig is underway to see if we can discover how old the field boundary is. What makes you think that that shape is particularly significant? Well, if you look at it from here, it's much more circular than any of the other fields around. And that suggests that it's there before the other fields are laid out and they've sort of been built up against it at some stage. It's the sort of shape in, in, in Wales, in Ireland, in Cornwall and elsewhere that you get associated with prehistoric farmsteads, prehistoric settlements that go on in use as farmsteads right through the prehistoric, right through the Roman period, into the Dark Ages afterwards. So we sort of, from a landscape point of view, we look at that and think, ah, oh, that might be encapsulating the, the shape of an earlier site. That's why we've gone for it. And what would you expect might be there in Dark Age times? Well, ideally, we'd hope to find perhaps defences around it, bank and ditch, perhaps re-fortified or re-emphasised from something earlier. And we'd, if we were lucky, perhaps from the geophysics, we might get patterns of buildings and so on. Although I'm bound to say, from up here, it's rather large. I think one of the advantages of coming and seeing it from the air is it actually looks a bit too big. For, for the sort of small enclosures you get in the, um, you know, in those post-Roman centuries. I, I don't feel quite as happy about it now from up here. The little island is tiny, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, I don't think it's exactly the size that it was originally, uh, because the, the reconstructions show it rather more drawn out than this very sort of tight little circle that we've got now. Nevertheless, it's not absolutely huge. And you wonder about the impressive, how impressive it would have looked as a fairly small feature like that with buildings on it. Yeah, I thought that the king would have built a palace on it, but there hardly looks room for that. Yeah, I, th I think that's true, but you see, our, our concept of what's big and theirs, I think, is, is very different. If you look at some of the churches of that period, which we know were referred to as magnificent structures, they're really like only as big as your front room now. You know, the whole, the whole scale of, of things was much smaller then. And no doubt, if you weren't used to a site like that, and there it was sitting out in, in, in the lake with, with palisades, defences round it, it would have looked pretty, pretty impressive if you, you come from a sort of glorified shed yourself, you know, glorified chicken shack. <laughs> you can just about see the causeway under the water now, look, on the right hand end, showing up really quite nicely. I just wanted to show you these fields down here, Tony, off the west end of the lake, because these are the fields that Carenza has drawn our attention to, where again there is a little peninsula of higher land projecting towards the lake. Yeah. And we were thinking, well, that's an ideal place for people to live, out on that little bit of higher ground. But although they've ploughed it, you see, these number of brown fields here, there's nothing, I don't think, obviously archaeological. There are some black what patches. Are those? Yeah, over there. Yeah, over there. They, they, they might be charcoal spreads or whatever. We might actually go out and have a look at those, see if there's anything with them. I can't believe that somebody would have used that little bit of higher land as a good place to farm and to settle. But uh, I think perhaps we'll have a look at that on the ground and uh, 
you know, see, see if there's anything to see. This is the three and a half ton piece of oak that Phil and the boat building team are attempting to transform into a dark age dugout boat this weekend. As Phil said, time is short, so the plan is to work in shifts around the clock to try and get it finished in time for the presentation. If we're lucky we can use this side of the tree without incorporating this piece of rock. Really? Yeah. And the maximum width we can have is up to here, is it? This, this is the heart. This, the is, heart this is the bit we've got to right. keep. No, we don't want a lot more. No, we don't want a lot more. Okay, just a bit more. Okay. Oh, yeah. I reckon right, we're about there. Woodworking skills like these would have played a crucial part in the construction of the Cranog. Rows of palisades cut from oak planks surrounded the island, and the remains of these can still be seen around the Cranog today. Our illustrator, Victor Ambrose, has been working on a drawing which shows how the palisades would have stood out of the water in the 9th century. Within the palisade wall, the Cranog floor was made up of rock and brushwood, and it's been estimated that over 1,000 tonnes of rock must have been ferried in carts or boats to the island and laid on top of these bundles of branches, which amazingly can still be seen around the shores of the island. Thankfully we got Damien with us, who's probably made more log boats than I got hot dinners. How's I it hope going? not, you'd be hungry. <laughs> <laughs> How's anyway. it going then? It's going very well, uh, incredibly quickly. We're starting out by doing each stage using the tools of the period, or as near as we can get to it. And then to save some of the time, uh, or to save some time, we're using chainsaws uh, for a certain amount of the work. Uh, Why don't you use fire? Uh, uh, they, well, they used fire in places in the world where they have trees which are naturally inflammable, like in the southeastern United States where the trees are full of resin. And a lot of European explorers who went there in the 16th century saw the Native Americans building dugout boats using fire, yeah. partly because they didn't have metal tools and partly because these trees will actually burn green. But oak is so full of water, this stuff, if you feel it, it's damp. It feels damp and cool. You feel it? It feels damp and cool. And it's so full of sap, this is a freshly felled tree, that it won't burn anyway. You Do you have to seal it when it's... Um, you probably don't have to, but a lot of... We know from uh, accounts from various parts of the world that people tend to use animal fat. So this bit down here has sm been smeared with lard to stop it drying out too much. It's not so much to keep the water out, it's to stop the wood drying too fast. Oak's got a bit of a tendency to split yeah. as it dries in the sun and the wind. And if you put animal fat over it, it slows it down and just reduces the splitting controls it to a certain amount. One thing you might notice, Tony, is that this is actually upside down. Yes. You are very, actually very looking important. at the yeah. bottom of the boat. Yeah. Oh, so I hadn't realised. Ah. <laughs> this is the bottom, and that's the, that's the front end. This is actually part of the palisade, is yes, it? Yes, you can actually see here some of the radially split oak planks that form the, one of the palisade lines. Nice. You can see how well preserved they are. Just one of the alignments that we have on the Cranog. Right, and they're still here after more than a thousand years, and they're, they're really solid still, aren't they? Very, really very well solid. Preserved. So this, this is a different phase, is it? That's right. You can see the timbers um, running in an alignment into the shoreline at this point. Oh yes, they're very impressive up there, aren't they? Very well preserved timber. And this is an area we haven't really looked at yet. Because, of course, this wasn't the shore when the island was built, was it? The, the no, island right. extended out here. So we're actually that's in the right. middle of the original settlement that's right. here. Where, where we've seen erosion over the last thousand years and the scrambling effect of waves, wind, wind generated waves, most of them, um, mixing up vines and dragging stone off the island. So what would you like us to do in terms of looking at the silts here? Well, uh, as you can see, what we have is a mixture of stone and silt. Mm. Um, what we've done in the past is carefully laid out corridors a metre wide underwater, and these have been systematically searched using bare hands uh, by Clear divers. Clear the stones away and then have a look through That's what's, right. what's left. And then sieving all the silt 
for the smallest of artefacts that survive. If we get set out this evening and work out where we're going to work tomorrow, then we can actually kind of start working through the silts tomorrow morning. Yes, it's, I think we can. tree and the shows a, a common feature around here now? I think it would have been in the 9th century uh, because not only was the dugout built out of a tall straight tree that grew up high amongst other trees and dense woodland but also the palisade timbers from around the Cranog were also made from very big oaks perhaps so much in diameter nice straight grain very few knots uh, and so on and growing maybe for 150 to 300 years probably around the 200 year mark generally. And those trees produce easy-to-work straight-grain timber that you can work by splitting. People didn't have saws then, so they couldn't use any kind of saw, hand saw or chainsaw. So they had to do all the work with adzes and axes, as we're actually doing now. There would have been less knot holes in the original logs yeah. because it was much more forested here. Yeah, it was much more densely forested. You can look at timbers from an archaeological site like Langors, record the way the, the, the trees seem to have grown from which the timbers were cut, and then you can actually, uh, to some extent, visualise the landscape of the period in three dimensions. When people manage woodland, mainly for firewood, they produce essentially generally smaller, knottier trees. In a semi-sort of natural oak woodland, the trees are, are being forced to grow up tall and straight, and that produces lovely, sweet, easy timber to work. So by looking at, at, at the boat in the museum, it gives us some idea of what the, the environment was like at the time? By looking at the boat in the museum and the other timbers from the site, yes. And uh, we can reconstruct semi-natural high woodland being, or if you like, forest, uh, wild wood, being a feature in the landscape somewhere around here. But in a way, when you see things like the... Uh, Clangorse number one boat, as it's called, in the Museum of Brecon. You can actually, if you, if you know what you're looking at, you can almost hallucinate and visualise the wild of the, of the period. Oh, I'd like to try that. <laughs> <laughs> it helps probably a few glasses of Celtic mead yeah. or something. <laughs> so, this is how the lake may have looked in the ninth century. But what about Mrs Mitchell's field? Do we have any clues as to how that might have looked then? Have the geophysics team found evidence of a settlement here? And does our trench contain the remains of a boundary ditch which might have surrounded it? How are we doing then, in the hole? Not very well, really. We've dug, <laughs> we've dug through, the, through the hedge line, for the boundary line, hoping to find a ditch or something, but yeah. uh, there's nothing in there. Nothing at all? Well, there is something in there. There's a, a, a modern water pipe. That's, that's, what, that's <laughs> what I'm about to fix. <laughs> but apart from that, uh, there's nothing, really. So no bank, no ditch, nothing. no structures at all. There's We're nothing. dealing with a hedge, then. We're basically a hedge line. OK, right, well, we, we'll obviously oh, stop here, Great! Think, <laughs> that'll please you, doesn't it? <laughs> How about you lot? Uh, there's nothing in this field, as far as we can see. We've actually done some, some gradiometry, yeah. and uh, nothing there. It looks as Not clean as a whistle. Not exciting. W would, would you expect anything to show up in this soil? Well, I think if there'd been yeah. settlement, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, occupation we'd at some stage, we'd have it. definitely got something. Yeah. But, I, I mean, it's a total blank. Well, that's fantastic, isn't it? End of day one, and we seem to have found out one thing for certain. There isn't anything in this field. But there's tomorrow, and there's the next field, which Mick noticed has got all those interesting crop markings in. So stay with us to see if there's anything in the other field. Oh, there is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find it. Ages, is that they have a habit of leaving you completely in the dark. The local people round here didn't leave any nice big bits of pottery lying around like the Romans did. They didn't build big stone walls like the Normans. It's the beginning of day two, and the only evidence we've uncovered so far are a few charred pieces of ancient wood which we discovered in the silt over there. But why is the wood burnt? And how come the buildings on that island, the palace or the stockade or whatever it was, lasted for less than 25 years? Well, it all hinges on a day in June 915 AD when an abbot called Egbert was assassinated. And unfortunately, at the time, he was under the protection of the most powerful woman in England, Athelflaed, the daughter of Alfred the Great. And for some reason or other, 
she decided that the king of Brachyniog was to blame for his death. And so she sent an army of battle-hardened Anglo-Saxons into Brecon three days later, and they laid the place to waste, and they captured the king's wife and 33 of his followers. At least that's one version of the story. Some people might say that it's a typical example of Anglo-Saxon propaganda to justify the fact that Athelflaed wanted to dominate the Welsh, so she sent the troops in. But whatever the true story, the facts remain the same. The buildings were burnt to the ground and the king's grand designs crumbled to ashes. The big question for today is what do we do now? Having drawn a blank in Mrs Mitchell's field, where else do we look for evidence of a 9th century settlement? Mick and Carenza have decided to have a quick look at the higher ground to the west of the lake, which Mick spotted from the helicopter yesterday. The theory is that the lake may once have been this size, marked here by the 160 contour line, which would mean that this promontory, like Mrs Mitchell's field, would have always been higher than the lake, but close to the water's edge. It's difficult stuff to try and pick up things in, because there's a lot of natural regularity in the stuff on the ground. Yeah, well, that's it? right. There's, there's, there's shaped blocks of stone almost. Nice square bits and nice rounded bits. Uh. But I don't think it's too obscured by the, the grass and the stubble. I'd be, I'd be quite happy. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of post-medieval stuff on it. Yes, it worries me slightly. Know, if, they've um, been, uh, yes, well, they've been hair, manuring and dumping the stuff. Yes, I mean, there's a bit more. Yeah. Um, it worries me that, yes, they've brought stuff in, and if we do yeah. find anything, we could possibly just be well, imported. It could have been brought in. Yeah. I think, that, you know, the critical thing is we've got to decide what we actually do with this field, you know, whether we actually uh, come and do some field work in it. Oh, here we are. Oh, that's, um, what's that's uh, one bit of flint. So it's like a little blade, actually. It's broken that's off that's in. A... Yeah, you can see it was struck there. Yeah. That's the, it's snap, been snap about top. that long. I mean, it's the only thing we've seen, isn't it? So uh, it's nicely patinated, and it's going yeah. to be, it looks about the right sort of well. It looks yeah. like a little bit. <laughs> well, that's right. We'll have to feel about that. You know, I think we should leave it there because if, if we are going to field think walk, we probably should. Yeah. We'll put it on that stone so that we can find it again. Right. But uh, you know, one piece of flint doesn't make a summer, does it? <laughs> it's. I mean, this is the problem we were saying earlier, isn't it? If we're not going to find anything, that really gives us any confidence about what else to do. By this method, unless we find a huge scatter of flint, they're unlikely you mean to do that. Absence it's of evidence is not evidence of absence. No, quite. It ought to be it's pinned up over every archaeologist's bed, isn't it? <laughs> Remind us that if we don't find anything, it doesn't mean there isn't anything there. It does mean we've got an absence of anything to uh, go on. I mean, lot of, lot of iron I still sort of think sort. looking at it, it's a good point. It's obvious if I was looking for somewhere to settle on the edge of the lake, yeah. I'd go here. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's I think a big we area. Look around the corner, though, because it, that's where the ploughed fields are down there. Those two ploughed fields, and they are sort of tucked off, off the lake, off what was probably marshy ground anyway. Yes. Possibility. So we found one tiny piece of flint, probably from the Mesolithic period, which Robin tells me is 12,000 to 3,000 BC. This means we've got evidence of activity here in prehistoric times, but so far that's all. In the incident room, Victor's making better progress. This is his reconstruction of how the Cranog might have looked in the 9th century. The silt search on the Cranog has now started, and Carenza and I are hoping to join them a bit later on. But first, what about Mrs Mitchell's main question? Where did they live? Well, we've still got a bit of work to do in the D-shaped field that we're in here now, but it's, it's um, not proved to be the answer to everything we wanted to, to know to answer this uh, Mrs Mitchell's letter. Is that a euphemism for nothing's turned up in it? No, not quite. I think... I think uh, no, no, don't be like that. <laughs> I don't think... No, we've got a bit more work to do. We asked me that a bit later on, but we thought we'd widen it out as a result of looking at the helicopter work we did yesterday. We're over... You remember over the western end of the lake we saw those ploughed fields, and I got excited about various patches and things in them. We've been wandering about there today. I mean, Karenz have been out there, and we've got a couple of bits of flint which you've got there, look, and one or two other things. And we think it would be useful to get the geophysics chaps to have a look at that. Is this, uh, is this an arrowhead, or am I just well, living we, in fairyland? We wanted Phil to look at it, actually, and give us a, a sort of diagnosis I'm of that. I'm sorry to report. Um, <laughs> it looks very much like glass. Um, 
Oh, it's not even Aborigine. Not uh, even Aborigine. Aboriginal. I don't think <laughs> they even they got up this far. No, this is far more interesting. But uh... Go on, you tell me what you think that is, and then I'll tell you what I've said it is. Well, it looks to me like a, a little broken bladelet. A snapped yes. off blade. Yeah. Oh, I, I got think that it's right a, then. A good, yeah. good, good chance it was burnt. Yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll pursue that. What about we'll a date for those, Phil? This sort of thing. Yeah, I'd be quite happy to sort of see something like that in the I don't know Mesolithic, Neolithic. But certainly not later than that, I wouldn't have thought. Yeah. I mean, God, what do you want? Answers from one piece? <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> anyway, we'll go we'll go and have a, a, a detailed look at that. Geophysics, possibly some field work. And the other the other place that we've sort of rather fixed on is the other church on the other side of the lake, this Langasti over here, which again is on a sort of promontory with almost a little knoll on which the church is built. Um I mean, we did, in our weaker moments, after a glass of wine, think we might have another Cranog over there. But let's be a bit more sort of level-headed so about it. So a bit more cautious about it. Yeah, that. but at least we could, uh, again, perhaps ask you chaps to look around that uh, with the geophysics, and then we'll perhaps have a think about that. We might even dig a test pit to see what sort of geology or whatever it is we've got there. And then that's then... You know, extending the range around the lake so that, you know, Mrs. Mitchell's letter was what was going on around the lake, who was living here, and so on. So, is it a question basically of knocking off the most likely sites for this royal compound or whatever it is, one by one? And at the end, hopefully, we'll come up with one on which our King of Brachineal lived. Yeah, the difficulty is we're in a period where they don't have pottery, they don't leave stuff lying around. The, the, the Cranog is quite exceptional. So, it's, it's, it's you know, we've got to. We've got to another day yet. We've got to crack on with it. Right, then, give us the three most important things to do now. I think the, the, the first thing is we've got to look at the churchyard, which is the, the early monastic site, and would be contemporary with the Cranog. We ought to look at this promontory on the western side um, for occupation of any date, really, on there, and we've got to look at the, the other church on the other side of the lake. And we've got to finish the boat. Ah, right. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already, I'm already taking bookings for the maiden voyage. <laughs> <laughs> because the preservation around the Cranog is so good, our best chance of finding Dark Age material within our three days has got to be in the silt around the island itself. So, while I make my way to the island with Carenza to help with the silt search, Robin takes Mick off to Flangor's church to look at a gravestone which dates to the time of the Cranog. Like Mrs. Mitchell's field, this church is surrounded by a circular boundary, which again usually indicates that this was here before anything else. It's possible that this was once a pre-Christian site, which has then been reused. This is one of these early Christian inscribed monuments yeah. that, uh, yeah. when, if one says they're relatively common in Wales, they're not that common this early. No, but they're almost the only thing we've got in both Wales and Cornwall and elsewhere for this long uh, sort of dark... Yeah, right, hang on a sec, hang on a sec. Hello, Tony. Yes, it's Mick. I'm in the churchyard. Over. We've had a rather interesting find here that I think you'll be pleased about. Where are you, Tony? I'd rather not check where everybody is this afternoon. Over. We're on the island, and they've just discovered under the water a Dark Ages shale finger ring. In good really Lord. good nick. Over. That's incredible. A shale? Over. Yes, Gail. Mark, tell us a bit about it. Hello, Mick. Um, it's a very significant find uh, in terms of uh, the cultural material that we're getting from the underwater silt searches. Uh, it's a shell fingering of a, a, a type that we know um, has been found on similar 9th, 10th century sites um, elsewhere in Britain. What is marvellous about this particularly fine example is that it is complete and in excellent condition. Over. Can you just confirm the date for me, Mark? Over. And they're both saying that it could well be 9th or 10th century, which correlates beautifully with our island story. That's lovely, Tony. I'll look forward to seeing that later on. We'll bash on now with our bit about the monastery here, which, of course, is also the same sort of date. Over and out. Have a good time. <laughs> That, that, that's right, isn't that's it? Great. I mean, a lot of these stones are around at that, that sort of time, aren't they? Well, they put kind of 7th to 9th century on this one, which yeah. overlaps again with the same kind yeah. of period. Yeah. Uh, the idea was you had, uh, in this particular instance, a cross, mm. and then the name of the person commemorated, mm. and then the name of the person that put the cross up. Right. So right. in this case, we've got a cross, yeah. followed by the name Gersey, yeah. 
G-U-R-C-I, and then Bledius down yeah. the other side. In other words, the cross commemorates Gersey yeah. and Bledius put it up. Right, right. Now, the normal context for these, although you can get them in parish churches, ordinary churches and chapels, they are mm. often associated with monastic sites. Sure. And we've mentioned several times about this particular place. So, I mean, can we take this as evidence of a monastery at that time, or would you be happy if we had some <laughs> better evidence? <laughs> well, like paper evidence. Well, think? we have got paper evidence. Right, right. Because there was a quarrel here between, between King Tudor mm. and the, bishop of, the then Bishop of Landaff right. in round about 925, right. which talks about the king turfing the bishop out of the church of uh, the monastery of Langorse. Right. Uh, right. And then the quarrel being made up. But w when we talk about monastery at that date, particularly in this part of the country, we're talking about a circular enclosure with huts and perhaps a few of these things standing up. Sure. Where... A tiny little domestic community. Yeah. Right. But this is one of our most tangible links with, with the period. Cranach and that period, isn't yes. it? We, all we've got is that one charter yeah. associated with the monastery and this piece one of stone, stone, the Cranog, and we're never going to better this from the, the fieldwork, although from what they're telling <laughs> us at Cranog, they're making a pretty good go of it. That's right. Well, this is a typical assemblage from the underwater searching. You can see the wide range of animal bones. Charred, presumably? Or possibly darkened simply from the burial conditions. Yes. What's that? This, this is a good, uh, well, a typical piece of furnace lining. And it's evidence for metalworking on the site. Metalworking actually on the site? Yes. Um, That's very interesting, actually, in point of view of the activities, what they were doing here for sort of the, the, the metalworking, what they were eating, sort of jewellery they were wearing. It's, it is a picture of the people that lived around. That's, that's the sort of thing Mrs Mitchell was asking about. So now we've seen the sort of stuff we're looking for. Should we uh, go and have a look for yeah, some of it? Yeah. Now we know what we're going to get. So they'd have been sort of swordsmith butchers in women's clothing, basically. <laughs> that sort of thing, yeah. yes. Yeah. Right up your street room. <laughs> <laughs> the bottle top and rock. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to do with all this vegetable debris. I think we can put those on the floor, along with the stones. See, something like that, I don't know whether uh, that's old, old and... That's right, it's very difficult. We get a lot of driftwood and, and twigs off the trees here, yeah. and they can look very much like fern. And a fish bone. <laughs> wow. It certainly looks as if that's that. Apparently, the ring was found in one of the first handfuls <laughs> of silt taken from the lake today. No such luck for me, but our luck is changing. We now have a dark age ring, and the boat building team are making fantastic progress with the dugout boat. So, time for an end of day meeting. The question now is what do we do tomorrow? Well, I think we're going to continue with the geophysics work there. Yes, we want to complete the whole of the, complete the site. All, all the way around ground. as much as we can get. Yes, and go inside in the graveyard. Yeah. 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 And then we need to cut the trench across there, keep our fingers crossed for some data oh, evidence uh, or whatever. <laughs> Hope we don't hit any burials. Yeah. That just leaves what's going on at the Cranog, which, which I haven't seen yet, which you've been mainly. Yeah, it's, uh, I, it's been pretty fruitful, and I think we should just... Are you continue be doing it. Yeah. Well, we're going to carry on. Yeah. We've yeah. had Tony in helping us along. But we found some, I mean, the, the ring's very nice. Mm. We found quite a few other bits and pieces. We found a, a charred grain as well. We're picking up that sort of detail. Again. So, stay with us. Yesterday we had nothing. Today we've got a Dark Ages ring and a possible Dark Ages monastery. Who knows what we'll have tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> So, 8am, day three. Only eight hours to go before the presentation to the public, and work begins at the Flangasty church site. Do we have enough time to dig a trench to discover more about the ditch which the geophysics team tells us runs across this field? 
Uh, this is the ditch Tony that we're interested in. Um, you can just see it on the computer screen. And that's where they've actually put the trench through. And we want to actually follow the line of the ditch coming out of the church. Uh, and then we're actually expanding the survey this morning uh, to see if the ditch turns and what its relationship is with the, the old field boundary. Have they got any idea what the ditch might be? Well, I think it, it's going to be the old boundary of the early church, the early monastic ditch. Uh, and so that's why there's the great interest in it. So would that imply that the lake would have come much further up this way, do you think? Yes, I think we're stood on a, another slight island here, and where Claire's surveying down there, she's actually in the swampy area, and that would have probably have been flooded. And that's why we're getting low readings down there. Yeah. But as we come higher up, we're on the drier ground. Yeah. So, will the geophysics survey of the rest of this field and the graveyard itself provide any evidence that Langasty Church stands on the site of an earlier monastery? Will we be able to tell Mrs Mitchell that this higher ground, which was once much closer to the lake, was occupied in the 9th century? Victor has been working on an aerial view of the Cranog, which makes sense of the various lines of palisades which can still be seen on the island today. This is absolutely fantastic, Adrian. I've been anxious to get out here. I just can't believe the wood, you know, sticking out of the water right behind me. Let's have a look at what you've got in this, this particular lot again, then, because it, now, now I've got the context of it. Yeah. There's, there's a bit of wood there. Look, that could be almost any date, couldn't it? Yeah. But it might be, might be uh, associated yeah. with, uh, with the crown arc, yeah. yeah. And we've got, uh, Modern contrast piece of glass. Ah, so. right. Yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, oh. obviously a problem to find bits like that. Yeah, yeah it's quite dangerous for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. And then we have a, down. That's right. We have animal tooth here. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's, we've had. That's, uh, that's uh, stained black by presumably chemicals in the water. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can see the roots of the chuck underneath it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's a fantastic process. I mean, it's. Uh, it's not quite underwater archaeology, but it's certainly no. not dry land That's archaeology, right. which is it? It's incredible that the water has preserved everything so well. And I'm sure that there's masses of evidence still to be found in these silts, which will tell us how the Cranog and the lake have been used in the past. Just by looking at how much wildlife still lives in the area today, it's easy to imagine how important the lake would have been as a source of food. So at the time of the Cranog, around 900 AD, people must have lived near the lake. The question is, did they live here at Langasty? Let's hope Phil's trench can help with the answer. It's got a lot of finds in it. At the minute, they're all very, very recent. But, I mean, it could well mean that there, there is actually was a hollow here to start with and that they've actually just filled this in, either deliberately or maybe as uh, it might have actually formed a, a hollow way, uh, an old root way. And that maybe in times when the, the ground got a bit boggy or something like that, you chuck in a lot of rubbish just to firm it up a bit. It's not worth putting the digger in for a few more inches. We have got diggers. We've got human diggers. Yeah, but they're not as fast as uh, that. No, but they Jason find thing. more. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the finds that you've found? When you say the finds are fairly recent that you've found so far, do you mean 19th oh, century? Oh, I mean, certainly. I mean, it's the sort of thing you've probably got on your sideboard at home, really, for old family heirlooms. Yeah, so you've got old, uh, old ink pots, obviously you got broken. And you see there, you've got a old bit of slate. It's not a, a not a roofing slate, it's just got scored lines on it. Oh, and like a school slate? Edge. That's it, pretty certain. I mean, there's another bit. So we're, we're probably somewhere near the school. Well, that's a great piece of archaeological deduction, Great Phil. step for science. <laughs> Time's really against us. But what we have to do is dig deeper and find the ditch, and then ideally find some datable evidence in the bottom of the ditch which would tell us more about when it was dug. We now have two trenches at Langasty, by the way. Mick has asked for another excavation to be done beside the existing church wall to see if it's been built on top of an earlier boundary. The geophysics team are working as quickly as they can, once they've completed their survey of the graveyard, there should be just enough time to process the results. With just a matter of a few hours to go, the dugout boat is almost finished. It's now just a question of finishing touches and making plans to transport it to the water. You know, Tony, we've been talking about the, the Irish connection uh, with this area, and maybe that was what impelled them to build the Cranog, a traditional Irish 
artificial island, there is another connection which we haven't mentioned so far, and that is in this immediate area, six stones inscribed in an Irish script called Ogham have turned up. Mm. And this is peculiar to South Wales. Uh, There's the odd one in England, but generally speaking, this is the area where it's concentrated. And this is Ogham? This is Ogham. Um, it's usually carved uh, around the corner uh, or the edge of, of a stone and is written upwards. How, how do you mean carved around the corner of a stone? Right, so you'd have notches on one side of a stone yeah. or on the other side of a stone yeah. or actually crossing over the corner. Right. And right. that would give you enough permutations and combinations uh, with no more than five strokes or notches to each letter uh, to get the 20-odd letters involved in the Ogham alphabet. And uh, I, I wrote along this vertical line that they called the Druim uh, the word Cranog, read from the bottom upwards with uh, the letter C, R, A, a single stroke right across the line, N, N, five strokes on one side of the line repeated, O, G. So what sort of thing did they write around here? Well, for instance, uh, I found one in this textbook uh, which commemorates uh, the daughter of Cunignos. Uh, and the stone actually uh, in Ogham reads, uh, the stone of the daughter of Cunignos, Avitoriga. And uh, this is Ogham in action in both uh, the Latin and in Ogham script. So you can translate from one to another. That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. This is one of the Ogham stones which is now in the Brecon Museum. You can clearly see the Ogham script on the left-hand edge. But does the fact that these stones were found in the area mean that it's possible that the Cranog was built by Irish craftsmen? Certainly it's a highly skilled job and the people who built it would have needed some knowledge of waterfront construction. Probably we'll never know. But what we do know, from a two-day search of the silt around the island, is a bit more about how the Cranog was used. Bits of animal bone, the furnace lining, the charred grain, and of course the ring, all add to our picture of life here in the 9th century. At Langasty, we've run out of time. Trench number one has revealed a boundary ditch, but we haven't got any finds from it to help us date it. Trench number two has confirmed that the present church wall has indeed been built over an ancient boundary which has been repeatedly used over the centuries. The alignment of these ditches does suggest it was part of a Dark Age settlement. But no time for conclusions now. The moment that everyone has been looking forward to has arrived. It's time to launch the dugout boat. You ain't gonna run off with that boat, are you? <laughs> Fantastic. It floats. And I must say I'm relieved, because Phil's threatening to take me on a trip across the lake later on. But first the presentation. A new excitement, because Mick believes the geophysics results at Langasty may show the remains of a Dark Age religious settlement. From what you tell me, these are these are hard packed sort of stone layers, basically, aren't they? They're, they're not. Um, We're not seeing individual walls as such, but it's or a, even individual graves or anything no, like that. No, they're, they're far too large for being graves. Yeah. They're seven or eight meters across, yeah. so perhaps building size. Yeah. Or... I mean, you know, the context to me looks remarkably like things around the wall inside the actual enclosure. And, you know, what comes to my mind are these, um, you know, Celtic monastic sites with a chapel or two in the middle, graveyard around it, and then cells for monks or hermits around the outside. I mean, you know, all we can say in sort of conclusion at the moment is that, you know, if this is evidence of cells of a monastery or a hermitage or something like that, then it, it's pretty unique and it's very important. Uh, and obviously we need more information from other sites and any work that goes on here to actually sort of sort it out. Will you be able to continue the work that we've just started at Langasty? Well, I very much hope so. I am both the National Museum of Wales and the University of Wales in, in Cardiff. Yeah. Um, have ongoing programs of research in early medieval wells and really it's just opening more doors for us and so I, I think we're going to see this develop in a big way. Well, it would be great if, if Time Team has actually started a new dig that goes on for some years, that would be brilliant. That, well that's right.
So how does all this relate to Mrs. Mitchell's question about life around the lake at the time of the Cranog? Well, incredibly, after just three days' work, we can actually give her a good idea of what was happening around Clangorse Lake, say, in around 900 AD, just after the building of the Cranog. The area would have been bustling with activity, and on the Cranog, there would have been smoke coming from cooking fires and furnaces smelting metal. To the north, there would have been an early Christian monastery, here, where Langors Church stands today, surrounded by the ancient circular boundary. And across the water at Langasty, it's possible there would have been another Christian site, which we think might have looked like this, with a group of isolated monastic cells built around a central wooden church, occupied perhaps by a group of monks leading a more isolated existence. And to complete our picture of Langors in the Dark Ages, it's easy to imagine at the edge of the lake that there may have been a solitary boat waiting to cross the water to the island, but probably launched by people who had had a bit more practice than Phil and I have had. <laughs> well, not the most elegant start in the world.